fantastic, these hybrid events. It's all yours. So that's okay. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, and it's great, great to see um, what I think is a really diverse range of, of folks um, come today. Um, the the um, my name is Robert Duff. I'm the uh, I work for Natural England. I'm the project manager for the Marches Mosses Bog Life Project, which is a, a, jo a joint uh, partnership project between uh, Natural England, Natural Resources Wales, and Shropshire Wildlife Trust. Uh, and its uh, focus is the restoration of lowland raised bog at fens and wicks or mosses, which I'm going to talk about a bit later on um, in the agenda. But um, to now I'm just going to do a sort of quick introduction really to the purpose of today. Um, quite rightly, when, when, when funders uh, invest in peatland, they're really keen that the lessons learned from individual sites or areas uh, are, are disseminated. Um, so, so what, so, that's not working, excuse me. Right, so um, so it's really important that our, our funders it, for the March Mosses Bog Life Project are the uh, EU Life and Heritage National Heritage Lottery Fund, and they place a great emphasis on being able to share the results and knowledge and get that fusion and interaction between you know different uh, stakeholders working in the peatland area, um, and hence um, one of our goals under the project was was to uh, sort of have organize a, an event like this where we can get people interested in in peatlands together so i see today the purpose of today really is about that sharing of knowledge and experience and lear lessons learnt um you know from from different angles because the the agenda now on, around peatlands is is very much about carbon ecosystem services and biodiversity um and and increasingly about polluter culture and and regenerative agriculture so trying to bring all those strands together and have a you know um have a discussion a really open discussion about that um obviously one of our goals is is to um sh present and showcase what we've learned during the bog life project so our project is um now coming to an end in october it's been going for six years so we've uh, We've, we've got some uh, lessons learnt, both uh, good and bad, and we're, we're happy to share those um, with you later. Um, and obviously, I think post-COVID, an opportunity for everyone to network and uh, uh, converse and engage, I think is really important. So I think just, you know, having, having meetings like this is so important now. Um, and I think we're hoping at the end out of today that that will distill some of the outputs from the workshops etc and there'll be some kind of uh, post conference uh, paper that will sort of bring all those strands together so there will hopefully will be something coming out of it at the end but just to set the scene and i know um most of you will all be familiar but you know peatlands are uh, amazing um ecosystem uh, soil type they, they cover 3% of, of, the, uh, of the Earth globally, um, but they contain 30% of all terrestrial uh, organic carbon on the planet, which is just amazing, isn't it? Um, and twice as much carbon as in the world's trees. Um, so it's, it's the, you know, the incredibly important, and in, in a way, I think it's, they're under-recognized for their value by society generally. Uh, in the UK, 94% of lowland raised bogs are uh, have been damaged or destroyed. So we've got a lot of work to be done to, to repair them. Um, and just to highlight the scale of the importance of peatlands is that our damaged and unhealthy peatlands um, are emitting twice as much carbon as all international aviation on a global scale so if we can fix if we can fix drain peatlands we'd be making a huge contribution towards 
you know, uh, tr trying to manage climate change, which, um, you know, let's be frank, no, no, no one can doubt now that the world faces both a climate and a nature crisis. And uh, I think peatlands are unsung heroes um, for us. An interesting thing that sort of grabbed my attention, just focusing in on the UK, is the in massive invisible impact that drainage has on our peatlands. Uh, there's a recent study done, I think last year, by Terra Motion, which is a, uh, which is, I, I think they're an offshoot of, of Nottingham University, and they did a subtle satellite study of 2.2 million hectares of peatland and they assess the change in ground level. Uh, I can't explain the techniques to you, I'm afraid, but um, they looked at change in ground levels over the last five years, and they found that 20% of that area had, had collapsed by more than two and a half centimetres, looking at peatlands. Um, so as a result of that, they've estimated that the UK peatlands are emitting about 10 million tonnes of carbon um, equivalent per year, um, which with my... Uh, on expert analysis, it, uh, I, I, I've sort of managed to calculate that that's roughly about what the the same emissions from 1.8 million people. So, peatlands, drained peatlands in the UK are having a you know a, are contributing massively to climate change. Um, the UK net zero strategy contains the figure that degraded, burnt, and drained peatlands emitted 4% of the UK greenhouse emissions in 2019. Um, so so it's, it's, it's a sizable chunk of, of UK emissions. And in many respects, it's, I, I would argue that it's, it's, it's low, low hanging fruit and that, you know, we, we, we've now, there's a lot of uh, knowledge about how we can restore peatlands and increasingly we're getting the, uh, the the, the, the jigsaw of, of the policies and the incentives are coming together, which provides a real opportunity for a step change, hopefully going forward. Um, and the last last thing on this slide, just to highlight, is, is that you know, bringing it down to the actual field level is that some of the um, some of the research is showing that just by rewetting rewetting a hectare of grassland, you can save 20 to 30 tons of, of CO2 equivalent per hectare per year. So um, I, to me, that, that those, um, I, I like to think in numbers and those, those really speak to me about how important it is to, to, to look at re-wetting our wetlands, our peatlands. Um, but there is an action plan. There is, there's, there is um, quite a lot of activity going on. And uh, so it, I'm, I'm going to focus on England, even though um, we are a cross-border project. Um, we've got another conference coming up in uh, October, which is going to very much focus on on Wales. So I'm, excuse me for focusing on England today, but the England peat, structure, uh, peat actions plan, which came out in 2021, um, sets some targets and goals going forward. Um, it, it, it emphasizes that we should be looking to work on all our peatlands, uh, not just deep uh, or protected peatlands, and that we need to try and achieve uh, responsible management of those areas, good hydrological condition, um, and try and get as much of those areas under restoration management. So that's the, that's the top line goal. Um, and then there's some targets in there, there's short term targets of trying to restore 35,000 hectares by 2025 using the um, Nature for Climate Fund, which I think Natural England's administering for on behalf of DEFRA. Uh, and longer term, they've set a target of 280,000 hectares by 2050, with uh, emphasis on the uh, environmental land management schemes and the reform of the Peatland Code being sort of key drivers for, for that. But, you know, that if you if you break that down, um, you know that's look, you're looking at 10,000 hectares of full peatland restoration um, each year for, for you know as we go forward. Um, and I, it's also ref I was reflecting on the figures that you know that, that there's 1.2 million hectares of peatland in England, and the the target is to restore 280,000 hectares 
by in 25 years. So, so it's it's only a proportion of that peatland resource. And the the third thing I think just to highlight, because um, we 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 are in the lowlands here, and I think um, there's a lot of activity going on in upland peatland, and in a way they're ahead of us. And I think they're they're kind of making there's quite a lot of strategic and uh, good investment going on in the uplands. But I think that the lowlands has got its own challenges and uh, for, for, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and there is a, a lowland agricultural peak task force, which I believe is um, sort of drawing up recommendations uh, about how to sort of improve the condition of lowland farmland um, peatlands whilst sort of trying to support um, continued agricultural management of those areas. Um, and I think they're coming up with some recommendations this summer. So that will be interesting. I've got no knowledge of, of you know, what their sort of uh, what their thinking is at the moment, but others might have. Um, now that that's the sort of national picture of it. Now I just want to little uh, to quickly focus in on our geographical area here, the region. Um, uh, some of you who who are from this area will know the uh, area that we call the Mears and Mosses. It, it, it's an uh, internationally significant complex, wetland complex that stretches from, um, from sort of south of the Mersey down to Shrewsbury. Um, and it stretches from Wrexham all the way down over to uh, West Staffordshire to, to Stoke and encompasses the area we're in now. And, and this sort of Cheshire, uh, Shropshire, Staffordshire plain is uh, peppered with wetlands from the from the glacial um, retreat that 10,000 years ago, and it's peppered with over 200 wetland sites. Now they're either depending on uh, they're they're, they're uh, sort of hollows left in the landscape, and they're either peatlands or or natural lakes. Um, but it is an incredible, rich, incredibly rich uh, wetland complex that's um, of, of international significance from a biodiversity point of view. Uh, and it has a, a considerable amount of peatland as well. So the, if you look at the whole of that landscape, there's 13,000 hectares of, of peatland. Um, and the, you know, the importance of these areas are quite a few of them are internationally designated as, uh, as Ramsar or SAC sites. Um, and over 50 of them are triple, have triple SI, um, triple SI uh, designation. So, so the re so what the reasons we've, we've we're going to be talking about both the carbon aspects but i think we mustn't forget the biodiversity importance of, of this particular landscape that we're talking about today you know the local one here so this is just to give you a, a, quick, a quick sort of overview of the landscape so you can see the the natural mirrors that's you know this is up at ellesmere but all those yellow uh, uh arrows are showing you where there's peatlands in the landscape, scattered across the landscape. They're a bit hidden and, and widely dispersed. So, so there's particular challenges with, the, with us trying to restore our peatlands in our landscape, because they tend to be quite small um, and in amongst the sort of agriculturally managed landscape. There has been, we, what, I think yeah, one of the other things that, to reflect on um, for me is the fact that We've been trying to work at trying to pro progress the conservation of these peatlands and uh, lakes over the last 20 years, and we've had various partnership um, uh, partnership uh, uh, projects going on over the last uh, 15 years, um, and we've made some headway. But what what does the future? What is the future for for, for working in this particular landscape? Um, we we, we we have we have we can either um, fragment into county areas working at a county level or we can try and work across or have a cohesive approach to the mirrors and mosses and if we want to, to have that cohesive approach across this wetland series um, I think some of the things to think about I'm just going to raise a load of questions here um, is, is to refresh our vis vision um, we need to maybe revive and rethink and broaden any partnership. Um, we need to navigate the new policy and finance context and opportunities. You know, we've got the focus on carbon, uh, we've got the uh, 
the DEFRA peatland schemes, we've got agri-environment, nature recovery, peatland code, et cetera. Um, and I think, I think going forward, we need, very much need to be looking at a farmer-led approach rather than a sort of government agency or outside interest approach to help sort of advance that restoration. And also to reimagine and, and reconnect with the local people about the value of these wetlands, which I think has kind of been lost over time. And obviously, all conservation work, all sort of progress is all about relationships and building those really strong relationships, I think, is, is, is critical. So I'm going to leave it with I'm going to leave the introduction at, at that and um, hand back to Julia. Thank you, Robert. We're not going to take questions for Robert's introduction, um, but we will have plenty of time for questions later. Um, okay.